Right. Thank you for those kind words at the end. And we've had four distinct presentations linked. Clearly, we've heard about food, people as a resource, housing, and of course, at the end there, uh, a cry for a interest in having a decent evidence base. Now, would anybody like to ask a question or comment aimed at, a, at one of the four participants we've heard now? Yeah, up at the back there. I, I have a question to uh, the uh, Hong Kong's Hei Wang Ho, and, and, and I think the presenter is not him. And and uh, and uh, other other people can answer this question too. And uh, uh, I always have a uh, question that uh, in for the for urban poverty and urban equality issues, we know we should do something. And uh, we uh, for for the case of Hong Kong, we can do something because the Hong Kong government have the resources. And we also know how to uh, how to do something. But the question is why the government do not do anything, do something. In for the public policies, we usually find uh, this kind of puzzles, and and uh, uh, we, we it seems we we know something we want to make a reform, but uh, the government always lagging behind. So uh, can you make your judgment, uh, your your thinking on why government do not do anything, and uh, do the government have some worry about something, or? or some other reasons. See, see, I think oh, you can you. Uh, answer you directly on that one. Um, I think it's, it's um, simple and also complicated um, because uh, I just told that um, there is no universal suffrage in Hong Kong. So our um, political leaders, they are representing the privilege. They are not rep representing the general public, um, especially the CE, the chief executive. He's only elected by 800 members. And many of them, they are land developers. They will not ask for reform. That's damage their privilege, damage their business. Uh, even they will ask the government to do more to harm the unprivileged more because they will ask they supply land for them to build their luxury housing rather than public housing. So, so it's, it can be simple also can be more political dynamic behind. So um, I think the solution is um, universal suffrage, democratic system is important. Of course, before this, we still can do something. We can push more social pressure. Uh, actually, SOCO doing long time for this. For example, we draw the social attention from locally or inter internationally. There is some progress, but not as much as we, we, can, we want to see, but there's still something worse. So we, I also, to draw your attention and hope you support us, we can have an international pressure for the, the government and they will feel shame and they need to present you better Hong Kong. Thank you. And just to be sure, your, your organization acts as a lobby itself. I yeah, yeah, we it. are a human rights organization and we organize these people to fight for their human rights, their right to housing, yeah. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Philip, and then uh, this is a question for Sharon. And um, um, sorry, from the beginning, this is going to go back to the very basics. But just listening to the four presentations, and of course, yours, I, I wondered whether there's any evidence at either the city or at the national level that we have successfully tackled health inequalities in the absence of healthy levels of income equality. Um, or whether that's ultimately what we need to talk about. Sharon. That's a nice, easy question. Uh, and we were having exactly the same discussion this morning on the, the radio program. Um, I don't agree that the only thing that matters or the basic thing that matters is income inequality. And the very fact that the relationship between income inequality and health inequities doesn't follow uh, a straight line is for that very reason. There's other things that matter. And I think what I was trying to make the comment uh, about and that many others in the discussions have made 
is that income matters, social equity matters, but all of those other conditions matter. So whether it's about the quality of health care and the physical access and economic access to that, or whether it's about the state of the food system or whether it's about the state of the, the built environment. So I don't believe that we'll ever see uh, improvements in health inequities if we only look for cities that have gone some way to look at income inequalities. I think we're, we, we become very focused on the, 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 the point that was made last night of if we only look at what's under the lamp, or if I'm, I'm paraphrasing badly, but if we only un look at what's under uh, the, the street light, then we miss all of those other things that have been happening around. So that was a long way of saying no, there's no uh, demonstrated evidence of if, if you just deal with income inequality, you'll do something about urban health equity. I mean, you started by talking about Glasgow, which is Scotland's biggest city and has hugely redeveloped itself very successfully economically, having had industrial decline, but it's evidence of just how good a city can be at rebuilding itself. Is there any evidence that, and you showed the figures with the uh, life expectancy with Glasgow at the top and the bottom, has that narrowed in that, those years of success, as the economic success of the cities returned? No. Uh, no, Glasgow hasn't uh, in terms of its uh, health inequalities. And it's not unusual uh, for cities that go th through that sort of uh, economic development. Like Glasgow, nobody has really understood why Glasgow is the way it is. Uh, you know, in terms of those health mm. and social inequities, it's the, the Glasgow conundrum. Um, and I, I, I certainly can't explain it all, but there's just that real historical cumulative social disadvantage that's been there, but with also a very strong community resilience. But we've still continued to widen the health inequities. Okay, thanks. Actually, my question was it goes the same direction. We had seen this very strong relation between social equity inequality and health inequities. And uh, Jason introduced the question that we shouldn't discuss uh, health in the city, but uh, the, the, the question of health, health governance. And I, I would be very curious if there exist successful examples of such a health governance breaking this very strict relation between social inequalities and these health problems. And we see the second question to, to um, Edgar, to this uh, splintered uh, urbanism in Africa, linked to the question, to the development of the informal development. What, 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 uh, I'm, I'm very much astonished when I'm looking to this informal development in the African cities, that you find a very low form of consolidation of this informality compared with Latin American cities. And, uh, I think the, the, the African cities are really in the trap of this, not, not developing this informality in a form of formality, and by this, the, this inequalities to health problems are reinforced. What, what can be the reasons for this? You, you have notion already. Yeah. yeah. Do you want, to, all right, hold on. We'll do this one at a time, short and sharp if we can. So, Edgar, do you want to talk about, uh, well, the informality formality point and governance if you wish to, but others sure. may want to talk about governance. Um, <coughs> well, I, th I mean, this is something that, that is of great interest to us. Um, and I think that um, a big part of the Latin American story is that there's a, they've got a long tradition of social movements around urban rights. And if you just look at Brazil, which is a leader you know, in this case, uh, in terms of informal settlement consolidation, working really sensitively with a sort of layered technical understanding of topography, place, et cetera, et cetera, with community-driven visions and plans for how consolidation should happen and intermediation in informal economies to supply certain building materials and so on. You had 20, 25 years of social struggles that consolidated into this, the statute of the cities, which really enabled 
for this process to consolidate. So I think that one has to look historically. You've got to look long term. And that the lesson that I take away from that is that when movements of the poor, social movements, connect through intellectuals and so forth into the political system and are able to achieve simultaneously legislative consolidation that gives certain rights with uh, a, a really um, sophisticated policy urban management framework that recognizes and works with a grain of informality, you get progress. None of those conditions exist in most African contexts. And on the question of governance, I don't know if um, Siddharth, would you like to comment on the point that was made on governance? Uh, urban governance is a, a complex phenomenon and there are always several elements in a city several powers in a city which contribute to governance. Particularly in the developing countries, the municipal bodies are not very strong. So therefore, there are several other forces that contribute to governance. And therefore, what we have learned and many others have learned is that building the community's negotiating capacity is a very important contributory force to put pressure on accountability and thereby increase, improve governance. So that's been our uh, learning. And it's been the learning of Shack Dwellers International, National Slum Dwellers Federation, many others who've tried similar approaches. Right, thanks. Stedford. <clears throat> Not for talks in this, this session, there was a kind of polarity between uh, science-based uh, analysis and action, and actually we can act before we have the science, in a way. We know what to do. And, uh, and except for the African part, there was some poetry in it, which uh, I liked particularly. And the question is, and I would like to invite comments since we are coming to the end of, the, of the, this, uh, this meeting. I mean, do, are we, I mean the, the science space in urbanization, the, the kind of building cities on the one hand and health and, and disease on the other hand, is completely different. And actually was completely differently expressed and, and the analysis was, was based on a completely different methodology. Is there any way to create a, uh, I mean there will not be a standard methodology, but a, a way to work on methodologies which are comparable and which combine these two completely different worlds of building cities and living in the city in health and disease. I think this will be important. And since this will concern 50% of the world population, I don't know of any science being more important than this one. I mean, it's, it, this concerns half of the population of the Earth. So I think we have to think about how do we build a science around the problems which we have been dis discussing uh, yesterday and today. And, and I think the talks, to, you know, in the last session, but all the other talks showed how important that is if we want to understand each other. I mean, I'll take that, I think, as a, as a helpful thought, which I'm sure both Richard um, and Christine, though, will pick up at the end. But it, it is a, the question which these conferences here in Hong Kong, but in previous, previous occasions when they've taken place, have, of course, looked heavily at spatial and planning and transport type issues, but this time deliberately at health. And the question of how, um, in a sense, governance and other aspects, physical aspects of cities. I don't know if you want to say anything about this, Rishi. Rishi. Um, uh, the way those contribute better or worse towards improved health and well-being is clearly a theme that this conference was explicitly designed to raise and will be picked up clearly from here on. So I'll take that as a contribution rather than something for an answer. Unless Rishi no, I think literally, I mean, obviously, it's a rhetorical question yours, yeah. which is that's the whole point of these meetings, I think. The Alfred Herrhausen Society has been pretty generous already now by just starting this debate, which cuts across different uh, disciplines. I think the very, very simple answer at the moment, hearing what we've heard these days, is that qualitative top-down assessment is not enough, and that an understanding of what happens at the qualitative side, at the subjective side, is absolutely necessary. And to bring those two together is actually part of that uh, new research agenda. I want to come back to that in a moment when we have time for another point. Now, there was uh, 
quick question for Edgar. Uh, you used two words uh, that visually, you know, compelling, but familiar words, splintered and, and fragmented. I wonder whether you can just elaborate a little bit more on why you see African urbanism, African cities are more splintered, more fragmented than Latin American cities in, in, or Asian cities. Um, it, it just, it seems it's there, but I, I think quite, the, the really compelling evidence that is more so in what ways is more splintered? Um, the, well, I was drawing directly on the conceptual work of, of Stephen Graham and Simon Marvin, and essentially their work tries to index the transition away from universal provision of bulk and network infrastructures to a more selective geography where infrastructure provision is tied to a capacity to pay uh, for that basically universal service. And because the formal economies in African cities are, are so much smaller, and because of the way investment for infrastructure has been structured in terms of the actual in investment packages, and the absolute insistence, including from the World Bank, um, of at least some capacity to return, pay, pay, pay for services in a context of large-scale poverty and informal economic life, you see, an, uh, you see two things happening. One, you see very partial coverage, and where you do see coverage, it correlates directly with formal economic life and with new foreign direct investment to get certain commodities out of the country to the ports and so on. So connectivity infrastructures. And so because of the historical lack of investment compared to Latin America and Asia, the physical spatial manifestation of that is just a lot more extreme. But I want to, I have to respond to this because it is really the heart of, okay. if I may, on the knowledge yeah, thing. Do, do. Because, so just two very quick thoughts. The one is that I think that what I've taken away from this is that I do think one mechanism to facilitate the science communities to come together is to figure out what are the, the multiple deprivation indices that is really the most helpful and to make sure that we can collect the data at a small geographical scale so that we can really understand intra-urban inequalities. So for me, that is very, very clear, and I take that back to our Healthy Cities interdisciplinary group as a way of refining that, because also what that does is it helps us to understand the repertoire of policy instruments that's available, how to work flexibly with that, given different geographical dynamics going on in a particular space. But at the same time, the qualitative stuff from the bottom up is absolutely essential, and in fact, there's so much variation in the manifestation of certain illnesses or lack of well-being and so on that is so culturally specific that unless you have some way of allowing people to define for themselves in response to some quantitative data what they think are the priorities and what they think is worth investing in in relation to their conception of what are pathways that make sense at that scale, you're kind of missing the point of dealing with what you know from the, from the indices. And so the real trick, I think, is to invest in both systems, but to build the mechanisms to facilitate that intermediation. And within that, to recognize that the model of the universities we've got is obsolete. So unless we have a, an agenda about fairly fundamentally reforming the kind of big ma science machines that drive the universities and the, and the disciplinary systems, we're not going to be able to service these kinds of scientific endeavors in a meaningful way. So that's just an additional comment. Right, okay, and patiently you've been waiting there, and then down, two, three, okay, one, two, three. Well, <coughs> short and sharp if you can, because we're running towards five, ten. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that it was, a, there was an amazing coverage on, on the presentations we got in terms of all the, all the different issues. One thing that it seemed to, I, I felt was missing a bit was a discussion of something that's come up a number of times, and that was the, the migration issue. And, and, and I just want to quickly, mention where I think it, it was it was missing. I mean, it was brought up as in, in, in relation to Hong Kong as it, what, it's not really migrants, it's not, or at least it's not just migrants. Um, but it's, I think it's, and we've brought it up several times in relation to, to the, the challenge that migration can create, largely in terms of as if it's an, in, an infrastructure, service, housing problem. But to some degree, that it's, in many places, it seems as if the challenge that migration brings is also a destructive destructive type of politics that comes out of 
a, a, a situation where prejudice is against migrants. So you even have situations where the migrants are not, um, all, you know, not particularly represented in the poor slum, you know, the exploding slum air, informal settlement areas, and yet it creates a politics that is that actually undermines a lot of the other types of actions that can be taken. I just maybe a couple of the presenters could respond to that. Okay, um, and we'll take Gora next. Uh, thank you. I just have uh, two points. One is relative to that uh, presentation on unlisted slum in India. Uh, this is just a note of hope because I remember very well when we published slum in 2004, estimate the slum population of India in terms of proportion, 35%. We receive an official letter from the government of India saying that this is not true. Our slum proportion is 16%. Myself, in 2005, I traveled to India. I worked with the National Statistical Office uh, to show them the methodology used by Habitat. That means communication is important. We can measure, but if we establish dialogue with government, they can. In 2010, India launched what we call nationwide mapping of slum, and now they have a program called nationwide slum free. Therefore, there is hope that even if we take time for government here to listen to us, they are here, and I hope that what happened in India will happen in other places. And, and do you find that um, there is a willingness in countries to um, how can I put it, to, to move towards a, a wider acceptance of <coughs> better measures, even if those better measures produce less desirable figures? I mean, or, or do they resist in some cases? There is a progress. Uh, I remember uh, seven years back, we have about uh, urban uh, of 100, what we call local urban observatories. But now there are more than 500. Why? Because there is request now from country where they want now to better monitor themselves, their slum condition. And we are receiving request and request for that because they understand now measurement is very important. And when you say measurement is not only counting slum, it's the integrated system where you have uh, education indicator, housing, and so on. Therefore, now housing is not just physical aspect. It's now understand that housing has an impact on the social and health aspect of people. Yeah. Well, thanks. I mean, I'm personally yeah. so interested in statistics. We could go and talk about this for hours, but I must resist. But thank you. Catherine. Yes. Uh, my question is uh, to Edgar. And uh, I think you, you painted such a stark picture of the urban landscape in Africa. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that some of the, uh, the structural issues have to do with the obstinacy of governments to recognize and acknowledge that urbanization and especially Islam development are things that need to be uh, addressed. And the question I had is, uh, is this how it has been like 20 years ago? I, I mean, are there any glimmers of hope that perhaps governments are starting to realize that this is the reality they have to deal with? And are there examples of that? But the second, uh, I think, more important question is, is why? Not why are governments obstinate, but what are we not doing right? And we being the people in this room, what are we not doing right that governments that are hitting like these brick walls with government to sort of uh, penetrate to a place where they can start doing something? Edgar, yours. Okay, very briefly. Um, I want to respond to Gordon's point just to absolutely emphasize that it is, it's a, it's a, it's a major omission, it's a fundamental question in understanding uh, at least my topic for this discussion, but Gordon is the expert, so read his work. Um, the, uh, in terms of Catherine's question, yeah, yeah, I don't know, it's a really complicated issue. Yes, there are shifts, and the reasons that there are shifts is that um, the kind of impressive growth rates of the last decade is increasingly tied to a discourse driven by McKinsey and by Monitor and so forth, that if you want to sustain this growth, you've got to understand the role of your cities and you've got to invest in the right kinds of infrastructures and so on. The problem is that those discourses are feeding very directly into the splintered form of urbanism that I'm talking about because there's no understanding about the need 
for using these kinds of long-term investments to address uh, systemic questions in cities. And the reason that is happening is that I think we are not part of those elite discussions and we're not in a way articulating our research and our work so that they can understand that as the shift is happening, that there's a different way of imagining urban trajectories. The second issue is that the, 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 the big problem in Africa is, is a big political economy question. So the slums are really the seedbeds of political opposition. So most political elites in many African countries are deeply anxious about this because they see this as the place where their own demise is being fostered. And that co weaves into uh, clientelist economic activity where local councillors are vested economically in the land redistribution and other informal trading and taxation systems within the slums. And so by definition, they've got no vested interest to solve the problem. So it is really intricate, it's complex. Okay, thanks. Now, Key uh, yeah. wants to No, ju just two, two observations, just thinking uh, when we started yesterday, I showed um, the water pump in central London as it was then in Soho, which caused the first cholera epidemic as a sort of uh, beginning of the problem. Uh, and then uh, in showing the image of the, um, the different sewers, uh, which were close to the beginning of a solution which had massive impacts in terms of planning and the relationship of public health and physical form. There seems an incredible simplicity and certainty about that solution. You've got a problem, you put sewers in, and you recreate the city, and you make them, you humanize them. And more or less, that's what happened to a lot of the cities we know. I sit here after two days, what's that one solution? I mean, it's just interesting that I don't think s sewers would do it. I mean, we've talked so much about the need to retrofit and to, so I just, it's an observation, and maybe, maybe times are different. This is, uh, that's one point. The other thing is I was very struck by Sharon's comment uh, that the work that she'd done with Michael, Michael and many others was seen as ideo evidence-based ideology. I, I love that idea. I mean, I, I think the, the notion that somehow you know <laughs> what the solution is and then you work around some sort of argument which sort of fits it, which then, um, ref well, sort of, confronts the reality that we heard from Edgar, certainly from Soko, fr even from Carrie Lam this morning, and certainly from Sigurd, of the invisibility of what is actually there. I mean, this is, this, the, this, it's very clear what the problem is. I mean, I will never forget, Edgar, when you and I went a month and a half ago to meet the new mayor of Cape Town, and it was as if the descriptions of Will, uh, of, um, Will Smith and you earlier of your city, it wasn't the city that they recognized. I mean, the people in the room were colored and white. The population is mainly black. Where the black population lives is literally invisible. It wasn't talked about until the foreigner happened to mention the fact that from the airport to her office, all you saw was sort of basically shacks without sanitation. So this notion of invisibility, but evident based ideology, which impacts on policymakers interests me and interests me in terms of the work we, you know, that we've been doing now for a number of years with Wolfgang Ute and, and, and uh, the LSE colleagues, is that what is the role then of a center like ours? I mean, wh what does it do? It's partly, and I'm saying this because Bruce Raymer often raises this, to raise awareness and therefore maybe work more outside the box with different media, in fact, in terms of television, newsprint, and others to bring this out so that the policymakers note it. Uh, and uh, just a question of what, what really the role of research and uh, academia can be in a group like this. Again, it's not offering uh, a solution except that you know, clearly just an awareness that you need to pre represent the evidence in order to confirm the ideology is, I think, a very powerful idea for all of us concerned in this sort of activity. Okay, well, we've got to move on. I mean, i just uh, add to what Ricky said. I mean, it's, it's clear that um, to answer, a uh, part to, to move on from the question he's just posed, it's clear that both national and city governments always face a dilemma. So it's a, 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 it's a question rather, rather than a statement. Always have to address the a, a dilemma of whether they are trying to 
boost their country or boost the city and present it in its best light, which they all feel the need to, or be open about the problems that they face. I think that, that, that challenge is, is not unique to any city or country, is it? Everywhere is faced with this problem of trying to show the best of itself whilst trying to address uh, the problems. And the, the, que the question that Edgar raises about whether to, repre to repress or address poverty, again, is, I suspect, not unique to Africa now, but has always been one that threatens power elites uh, in, in any city at any time. Um, and one final point before I hand, uh, ask Richard Sennett to say a few words is uh, simply to say the one issue that personally uh, uh, I, I think we could gainfully address in future is the extent to which resource redistribution is an issue in all of this because um, the way in which tax systems work when they work and allow the redistribution of resources to address health needs, I think is a profoundly important one. We haven't discussed it much in the last couple of days, but it clearly is one uh, that, is, uh, that has a, an enormous potential to shift resources in order to address health care and public health problems. Anyway, uh, I'd like to thank our four speakers, Sharon, Edgar, Silai, and Siddharth. One more round of applause for them.